Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I thought I'd start off by just filling in for everyone who doesn't know what the RI is and what we do, a little bit about the background of why we do masterclasses and, and where that comes from. So just a quick show of hands, who's never heard of the Royal Institution before? So we can put a hand down to works there. Um, who has heard of them but really doesn't know what we do? or thinks with the Royal Society. A few people, excellent. So just a very, very quick overview. We've been around a very long time, since 1799, and we've always been about science communication. And whenever I say science today, I don't just mean chemistry, physics, biology, I mean all of the STEM subjects, all of the subjects around that. So it's always been about getting the public involved, getting other people involved who aren't scientists, as well as the scientists. Science is a big part of our culture. It's incredibly important in the world around us. And that is why we believe so passionately in our mission, which is the thing that's up on the screen behind me. And it's why all of our activities are really about getting people to think more deeply about the wonders and applications of those subjects. So we have a huge public programme, we have talks, we have short courses, we have family events, we have late events, we have education programmes, so we have um, science shows and CPD and things that go into schools all across the country, we have labs in our building and in the University of Central Lancashire that do workshops so that children can come in and do stuff they can't do in the classroom. Um, there is the masterclasses that I'm going to talk to you about today. And we have a really, really good, I really do encourage you to go and look at our video channel on YouTube. It's absolutely brilliant. We make our own videos, we film our talks, we do have sort of collections that relate to other people. There's animations, there's all sorts of things on there. You can fill anywhere from sort of five minutes to five hours or five days worth of stuff. So I really do encourage you to go and look at that, even if you will never go to London, will never come and visit us. Please do, do go and look at that on the website. Today, though, I want to talk to you about the masterclasses, and the masterclasses wouldn't be here without the most famous thing that we do, which is our Christmas lectures. So quite a few people in this room, I'm guessing, will have seen a Christmas lecture at some point on the television, even if they don't realise that it's us that do them. They are celebrating, I think it's 80 years being on the television this year, which is very <laughs> exciting possibly the first science programme on the television. We're not 100% sure, but that's really, really cool. Um, and they are about something different every year. They're all on the online video channel as well, so do take a look. And the reason the Masterclass programme started was after they did the first Christmas lectures on maths back in 1978. And the Masterclass programme has been around since 1981. We have networks all that span all across the UK, except Northern Ireland, not because we don't like Northern Ireland, but no one in Northern Ireland has got involved yet. Um, and we have masterclasses in mathematics, engineering, computer science. And at secondary level, it's all those three subjects. At primary level, it's just mathematics. But obviously, that's the most important one, so that's OK. And the masterclasses are there to really encourage and inspire and engage the students. The students themselves are nominated by their teachers to attend. It's only a few students per school and all schools in the catchment area are invited to send some along. There are, they are running series of sessions, so the students go to all sessions in a series, and there's a different topic every week. And it is extracurricular, it's not acceleration, it is very much broadening their view of mathematics and, more importantly, getting them to do it, getting them to explore. We have a huge range of wonderful volunteers that we work with, universities, <coughs> schools, other institutions, a lot of people in this room, including institutions like the Further Math Support Programme. We work with a lot of their area coordinators, maths hubs, universities, I've already mentioned, people all over the place work with us to make this happen in this, in this area, and we really couldn't do it without them. And what I wanted to focus on today was really what we do to help the speakers put together the sessions for this. So it really is about the depth of engagement that the students get. They attend all sessions in that series. Those sessions are long sessions. For secondary, it's two and a half hours on a Saturday morning. For primary, it's usually between one and a half and two hours. Slightly shorter, because attendance spans slightly less high. Mm -hmm. But it really is about getting them to feel different snapshots of different areas of that subject, but real applications, things they won't have seen before, or things they maybe have seen in the classroom in a completely new context. And it's really, really important. 
for us to work with lots of different speakers, for the students themselves, whatever their age, to see lots of different speakers and really see those role models and most importantly, see what makes so many different people so passionate about mathematics and show how much they love that subject. Because we do have speakers from lots of different backgrounds, we really work with them on really tailored individual support. So it could be a range of different things that they have more experience in or less experience in, and we really work with them to help them put together their favourite idea, might be a favourite bit of maths or bit of art or physics or whatever, that they really love, and to work that into that two and a half hour session. We do help with all sorts of things like structure, teaching advice, things like that. We also put them in touch with other speakers in the network that might be doing a similar topic to them or might know, sort of have resources that they can share and things like that. And we have our own resources that we can share too. So it might be support materials, advice and structure, things like that. It might be actual sort of teaching resources that we, activity resources that we can share with them. We have way more of those at primary level than we do at secondary. So please do let us know if you'd like to find out more about that. And we make sure that they go and see a masterclass too. And when we are working with them on their ideas, it's very much about what the students can do, what the students can get out of it. So what do they want the kids to walk away with? Is it understanding that viruses can replicate themselves really easily and the patterns in all the patterns and the symmetry and the maths involved in that? That could be a goal or it could be, I don't know, it depends really on the topic. And it's making sure there's enough challenge in there, there's enough depth in there, there's enough room for them to explore. We don't want them learning a method and then doing some problems to cement that learning. We want them to really explore a topic and find out why and how this thing works. We also talk to them about, right, what additional applications does your thing have? The thing you're talking about is really cool. Does it have other, other areas that it works in as well? It's something they will see in the real world or just something surprising, links to other subjects. Is there anything that made you go, wow, that sort of thing? So it's really sort of teasing out what makes them really excited about their subject. Why is their subject relevant to them? And getting them to talk to their students about that. It's all about the activities as well. So some classes can be hands-on, some classes can't. There is, I did want to do an activity with you guys, and it is the end of the day, so I'm definitely going to do it. Mm. It's pretty much the only one I could think of that was mine and not stolen and could fit in two minutes with 100 people. So I'd like you, if you know me already before today, stand up, please. OK, sit down if you haven't seen me in the last six months. Excellent. OK, we'll make do with this. Right. I'm sorry, guys. I have a horrible disease. You're all infected. What I would like you to do is shake hands with someone near you. <laughs> quickly, quickly. All right. The person who's just had their hand shake, shaken, think of a number between 1 and 10. If your number was 8 or above, you're also infected. Stand up. All right. Repeat. Shake hands. Everyone, everyone shake hands. Find someone near you to shake hands with. Could be the same person as before. Right, person who's had their hand shaken, think of a number between one and 10. If your number was three or below, you're infected, stand up. <laughs> and we can go on and on. And the students themselves can play with infection rates. They can play with how many people you shake hands with. They can play with immunity, with vaccinations, with network structure. There are clusters of people in different areas. If you vaccinate around them, will it work better than if you vaccinate all of these people in the middle that aren't anywhere near anyone they can shake hands with? All sorts of things like that. So it's not just about the activity itself, it's about what you can do with it and what direction you can take it in. Sit down, guys, you've been great, thanks. <laughs> there are lots of ways you can get involved if you'd like to. Um, the reason I wanted to come and talk to you guys today was to say you can get involved if you want to, and if you're doing similar things, Let's talk anyway. Um, you can volunteer as a speaker. We have series all over the place. There may be one local to you who needs speakers. Let us know. We can put you in touch with the local people. It might be that there's a series with near you that you could help out with. If there isn't, you might be able to start a series. Who knows? Um, you can put us in touch with your network. So it could be teachers that you work with. It could be other people that might want to get involved, all sorts of things like that. Raise a hand if you're already involved in the room. Lots of people here, they can't all be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, and of course, we are an independent charity with no government funding. So if you know anyone that would like to give us money, <laughs> let us know. Could be giving us lots of money for us to keep our jobs um, and support those people around the country that actually do all the work. Um, or it could be directly supporting a local group and funding their series and their speakers and things like that. Um, do come and talk to me. I am here the rest of today, or you can get in touch with me by email as well. Um, what I will do is also introduce Zoe. Stand up, Zoe. This is Zoe. She looks after our primary mathematics masterclass network. I look after our secondary mathematics masterclass network, except the bits in London, because we have a lot of series in London, um, and it would be too much work for one person. So we're both here. Please come and talk to us if you'd like to find out more. Um, Matt, we started slightly late. Do I have time to show, share something with people? You have two minutes. <laughs> Three. Um, <laughs> one minute. The one thing I did want to share with you as well, the programme I work on and the programme Zoe works on is the Masterclass Network. Um, working with those, those kids that are really engaged, they're already enthused, and we want to keep them interested and keep them engaged. That's why we do what we do. We don't necessarily know if they're going to be the mathematicians of the future, but we want to keep them interested. But there are lots of teams at the RI that do. We're actually quite a small team, but we do an awful lot of stuff. Um, and one of those things is that we, we all really quite like maths. Um, we love maths, in fact. And we do try and do lots of other stuff beyond just the Masterclass programme, which tries to share that love and this was something that came up fairly recently and I just quite like it so I thought I'd show it to you. Is, is it possible to get something from nothing? This is the story of a very important number but a number that wasn't always a number. In fact it was much less than a number until relatively recently. This is the story of zero and it's a story that takes a torturous and meandering route through 1,500 years of human history. Today, we enjoy Zero in all its glory, where it takes on two roles. The first is as a placeholder within our positional number system. Zero notes an absence of a value and allows us to create huge numbers without the need to create new digits. So we know 30 is larger than 3, and 300 is larger than 30 and 3. The second use of zero is as a number in its own right, the middleman, if you like, between positive and negative one, and enjoying nearly all the same benefits as other numbers. We can subtract, add, multiply by zero, but dividing by zero just doesn't work. For example, you can't divide one chicken by no chickens. You might suggest the answer is infinity, but it's not, because infinity isn't really a number, it's a concept. Mathematics developed from a very practical desire to count things, such as the passage of days or the quantities of chickens you owned. To manage this, ancient civilizations developed rudimentary number systems. For example, the Babylonians used two symbols in different arrangements to create unique numbers 1 to 60. The ancient Greeks and the Mayans also developed their own number systems, and all of these civilizations are thought to have created their own rough concepts of zero as a placeholder. But it wasn't until the Indians began developing their own number system that zero would be defined explicitly. Their early number system would also evolve into the one that we use today, initially with nine number symbols and then a small dot used to mark the absence of a number. In the 7th century, mathematician Brahma Gupta developed terms for zero in addition, subtraction and division, although he struggled a bit with the latter, as would academics for hundreds of years to come. As the mathematics of India matured, it found its way eastwards to China and westwards, influencing the Islamic and Arabic cultures where it was instrumental in trade. But zero found resistance in Europe, as the Hindu-Arabic system was opposed by the Roman Empire's established numeral system. However, by the 13th century, academics such as Italian mathematician Fibonacci were championing the new number system in their work, helping zero to gain a solid foothold across Europe. Over the next 400 years, as mathematics evolved from practical applications to ever more abstracted functions, zero would form the cornerstone of calculus. 
Calculus allows anyone to break dynamic systems down into smaller and smaller units approaching zero, but cunningly avoided the trap of having to divide by zero. Zero had now become a celebrated tool in the mathematical arsenal, and as the binary numerical system formed the foundation for modern computer programming, Zero once again stepped into the limelight to prove its worth. And so it seems, after all this time, it was finally possible to get something from nothing. That video was longer than I remembered. Um, one <laughs> final thing I will say is, if you do want to find out more about not just the masterclass, but all the other stuff that we have done in the past year, there's a couple of copies of our annual review. Please take them away from me. They are deceptively heavy, um, including stuff like the animator in residence program that made that video possible. So thank you all very, very much.